Okay, we have a substantial number of people already joining and uh, people are continuing to join, but um, welcome to you all, uh, to our uh, Senior, Law Senior Lawyers Committee uh, seminar from Alec Karakatsanis, who will speak today on cash bail and the punishment bureaucracy. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Senior Lawyers uh, Committee and also mention that we are co-sponsored by the Civil Rights Committee and the Criminal Justice Committee from the New York City Bar Association. Alec has um, written a book on unusual cruelty, which is a sum of probably his, his work over the past six to 10 years. And he addresses what is in our system as really criminal injustice. Um, Alec graduated from Harvard in 2008 and in 2014, as uh, using his seed money from a public service venture grant, uh, went to Alabama and visited courts and found that people were being incarcerated in jail for simply owing money for traffic tickets. He started to file cases against these debtors prisons um, as unconstitutional under Bearden v. Jordan, Georgia, in that a person cannot be jailed for not having funds to pay a fine. In 2014, he founded the Equal Justice Under Law organization and continued to work on these, these issues of incarcerated persons, caged human beings for non-crimes. In 2016, he also he founded the Civil Rights Corporation, Corp, Civil Rights Corps, and also started to work on the bail system, bail and jail, and the criminalization of poverty. This ties in with also another seminar that we had in December by Joanne Page, who also knew and said that there is no criminal justice system, but a criminal legal system which is not justice at all. And in, in her case, there was imprisonment for a simple violation of parole. Alec will speak today about his experiences and his theories on um, the criminalization of poverty. And the title of his talk is Cash Bail and the Punishment Bureaucracy. And uh, I think he has a lot to say that about what is happening in our country and has been happening for many decades, if not hundreds of years. So Alec, I will turn it over to you and we look forward to uh, your talk. Also, any questions can be put into the question and answer um, icon down at the bottom of your screen or possibly the chat and I will be fielding them to Alec uh, toward the end of the talk. Alec, thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Gertrude. Actually, it would be my preference if we could have a more interactive session. So okay. if, if folks have questions or comments, I find that it's, it's really most helpful for me to address them right away as they come to you. And so um, I really encourage you to put your questions in and Gertrude and I will, will take a look at them and answer them you know, in real time. And you don't have to wait until the end to, okay. to make a comment. Um, Great. I think that'll, that, be... that'll be more interactive. Yes, I, I kind of like that myself, but I, didn't know how this was going to work. So we'll makes see. Sense. Yeah, okay. that, makes, that makes sense. And so I'll just start by saying a few things about my background and my experiences and how I'm coming to this. And then um, hopefully you all will have questions or comments and we can engage in a discussion <laughs> together. Um, so the other thing to, to note just right up front is that I'm coming at this um, with a certain bias and a certain perspective. And that perspective is of someone who has represented um, people for the last 13 years um, who are impoverished, who are disproportionately people of color, who are the most vulnerable people in our society who are being caged by this large metastasized punishment bureaucracy. And so my bias will come through in my remarks and I, and I hope you, 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 you 
take the things that I'm I'm saying to you as just one perspective on on how I've experienced um, this massive system of of assembly line um, processing that we call the criminal justice system. Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a general introduction on, on where I'm coming from, and then I'll talk a little bit about the cash bail system in New York and, and elsewhere and the constitutional and policy considerations around it and, and, and how the cash bail system is, and, and the efforts to you know, reform the cash bail system are, are really a, a, a broader set of lessons for how we can think about um, transforming and dismantling this, this larger uh, punishment bureaucracy. Now, the first thing I, I wanna say about all of this is that we have to understand um, the criminal punishment bureaucracy in the context of this current moment of mass human caging. We are caging human beings at a rate that is unprecedented in the recorded history of the modern world. About five times our own steady historical average until 1980 and about five to 10 times um, other countries around the world. Uh, we are also caging black people at a rate six times that of South Africa at the height of apartheid. The human caging that we are engaging in is not randomly distributed. It's disproportionately targeting black and brown people and overwhelmingly targeting people living in poverty. Um, and and my, my journey through this, this, this system really began um, when I graduated from law school and became a public defender uh, in Alabama. And the things that I saw in, in, in that work have really stuck with me and have really changed the, the course of my career. Um, one thing I want to, to describe right away is the incredible brutality inherent in putting a human being in a cage. Um, when I, um, left the public defender's office and, and started doing civil rights work, uh, as Gertrude mentioned, with a grant from Harvard Law School. Um, I went down to Alabama um, and uh, started visiting courtroom to courtroom, jail to jail. Um, and the things that I saw on, on that visit in 2014 um, shocked even, even me, who had been working in indigent defense for years as a public defender, first in Alabama and then in Washington, DC. Um, I saw human beings in cages um, sleeping on top of each other in feces and blood and mucus and mold and urine surrounding them. I saw them deprived of all of the basic things that we all take for granted each day, um, like the ability to go for a walk or sunlight or fresh air or hygiene products, toothbrushes, soap. Um, these are the things that are, people are deprived of. I have seen this in almost every single city and, and, and county that I've been in around the country, and certainly in every single jail that I've actually been inside. Um, unspeakable brutality, lack of basic medical care, mental health care, rampant sexual and physical assault, um, inadequate access to food. Um, many of the jails around the country now um, have eliminated in-person visits uh, over the last six or seven years uh, as a result of working with large prison telecom corporations on the theory that um, if you eliminate in-person visits, people will be forced to spend more money on phone calls and video calls that these companies have monopoly contracts for. And so it was actually, um, this is the pioneer in this, is the owner of the Detroit Pistons, um, Tom Gores, who, whose company Securus uh, is the largest um, share of the market in the prison telecom industry. And they actually insert into their contracts with local sheriffs and jails that the sheriffs and jails can take a cut of the extra money that they get um, after banning in-person family visits. So this is a, a system that is putting people in jail. And keep in mind, about 500,000 people are in jail every single night, even though they're presumptively innocent awaiting trial, the vast majority of them solely there because they can't pay cash bail. There is a huge industry to profit off of them by removing their ability to even hug their children. Um, and, and, and what I call monetizing human contact and human touch. And this every other aspect of, of, the, of the local jail and bail system has also been privatized. You're probably familiar with private prisons, but obviously in local jails and, and um, county jails throughout New York and in state prisons, virtually every single aspect of, of daily incarcerated life is privatized from the medical care to the products that are made to large corporations, to the food commissaries, to the toilet paper. Um, 
this is a, a, a multi-billion dollar industry in virtually every one of these different domains. Um, and, and the bail system, you know, the multi-billion dollar yearly for-profit commercial money bail system exists only in the United States and the Philippines. Um, no other country in the world allows corporations to profit off of um, the extortion and ransom that is the modern cash bail system. I don't use that word ransom lightly. It's actually the title of a book um, written by former Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, um, Goldberg, in the 1960s. And so one of the things I want to talk about in my talk today is um, how could it be that there was a, a, a movement afoot in the 1960s um, that led to uh, sort of what we call the first era of bail reform, and yet the problems associated with the money bail system and the injustices associated with it have only gotten worse since then. Um, and, and so um, I'll talk a little bit about, I see a question in the box about when the bail system started. Um, we've had some version of the bail system to answer your question. Thank you for that, uh, that question, Jason. Um, the bail system has existed since before the Magna Carta. However, for the first sort of thousand years of the bail system, bail was what we called unsecured. And, and that, that basically meant um, you didn't have to pay money up front to get out of jail. It's just you had you or your sureties, which was more common, would just promise to pay something um, to the local English, uh, you know, for the first few hundred years, so the local English crown representative court system. If you didn't uh, come back to court, you, your surety promised to pay for you. Um, that was the way that we imported it into this country um, sort of in the early constitutional era. It was only um, uh, about the turn of the 20th century in 1898, um, it was really the first known example in San Francisco actually of the for-profit commercial money bail industry. And as society changed, um, the, the, there were a bunch of business interests that decided they could monetize this unsecured bail system by, by, by promoting uh, secured money bail, which means that you have to pay money up front to get out of jail. And then with, with the people sort of traveling more and more around the country and, and, and less, the sort of system of personal sureties was sort of less available. Um, and so there is this business entity that, that came in in San Francisco and said, we'll, 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 we'll try to promote the use of secured money bond. And then we can get people to pay us a fee for being their surety because people don't have the same types of, of community connections that they, that they used to. And, and the, the, the surety, and we're arresting more people in the surety industry um, sort of is this uh, innovation that we can market to local courts and, 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 um, and government entities. And, and, with, and, it's, and it still wasn't even the predominant secured money bail still wasn't even the predominant mode of release um, until mass incarceration. So we think of like, you think of TV and movies, you know, bail, bail is actually associated with secured money bail now, even though the term bail for a thousand years has actually meant conditional release. And it usually wasn't secured money bail. But with the rise of mass incarceration and, and vociferous lobbying by the for-profit money bail industry and um, really the key actors here were prosecutors, they realized that uh, something was very important was happening with the punishment bureaucracy. We were arresting so many people, um, more people than any society had ever tried to arrest before. We couldn't possibly provide all of those people with zealous defense lawyers and jury trials. It's just impossible. So what do they do? They realize that we need to invent a system of what we now call plea bargaining. And um, one of the, the ways in which the plea bargaining system functions is it coerces people into pleading guilty. And its goal is to coerce people into pleading guilty as quickly as possible. In one of our big landmark bail cases in Harris County, Texas, um, Chief Judge uh, Lee Rosenthal of the Southern District of Texas in Houston um, made a, a very interesting finding um, as the result of an evaluation of hundreds of thousands of cases and all of the data and a bunch of professors and experts sort of testifying in that trial, which is still the only trial to ever put the American money bail system on trial um, since the rise of mass incarceration. Her finding was that if you couldn't afford money bail in misdemeanor cases in Houston, which were about, um, about 50,000 of them every single year, um, you pled guilty 84% of the time and you pled guilty in a median of 3.2 days. The money bail system was what was being used to process people in the assembly line as quickly as possible because when you got to court, you were told 
it's fine if you want to fight your case, you're welcome to fight your case. But if you want to fight your case and you can't afford to pay, you're just going to stay in jail. But if you want to plead guilty and owe us some fines and fees, we'll let you out of jail today. And most people who want to get back to their schools and their homes and their families and their jobs and their churches and their loved ones, their children, they, of course, choose to plead guilty. But uh, Chief Judge Rosenthal found if you could afford just a few hundred dollars to get out of jail, you were more likely than not to never get convicted at all in Harris County. 51% of those cases were either dismissed or acquitted. And those cases lasted not 3.2 days, but 120 days. And so one of the, the things you have to understand about the rise of the modern money bill system is that it's not just about corporate profit. It's also about the bureaucrats who run the criminal punishment system understanding that they need a way to coerce quick guilty pleas because there's no possible way of providing lawyers and investigators and jury trials for all of the people that they're, that they're arresting. And so the money bail system is one of the system's ways of putting so much pressure on you without putting a lot of work in at the front end by the system um, to resolve your case in a way that, that is profitable for the system and that keeps the assembly line. Moving. I'm really uh, thankful for your question, Jason. Um, so I uh, came at the money bill system through our debtor's prison work. We were having success all over the country um, uh, challenging the notion that people can be jailed just because they can't pay uh, tickets or fees or, or, or um, other sort of court costs associated with, with their convictions. Um, and we brought these cases in Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi and, and Texas and all over. And, and shortly after the murder of Michael Brown, I went to Ferguson. And, and what I saw in Ferguson um, was uh, overwhelming. Um, we, our investigation was subsequently confirmed by the DOJ investigation. Um, and we found that um, the city of Ferguson averaged 3.6 arrest warrants per household. Um, almost all of those arrest warrants were for unpaid debt to the city um, from, from traffic stops by cops um, or, or stop and frisk situations where they arrested someone for you know, resisting the officer or possessing a small amount of drugs. Um, and so this is an average of 2.2 arrest warrants for every adult in the city of Ferguson. Almost all of them, I still, in, in the six years that we've been litigating that case, I, seven years actually now, um, have not in, encountered a white person with a warrant out. Um, so one of the things that they were doing though was they were calling, they, they were arresting people uh, on these warrants and then putting a cash bail amount on, on the warrant and sort of using the cash bail System. And if you paid your cash bail, they would just take that money for the debt that they said they owed you. So they were merging their post-conviction debt collection enterprise with their cash bail system. And it occurred to me as I was investigating this that the, the legal principle that we are vindicating all over the country and winning on is that no human being should be put in a cage because she can't make a payment. But that basic principle is really the underlying core of the American money bail system. And at the time that we started bringing those cases, um, there were uh, about 450,000 human beings in a jail cell in about 3,163 local jails around the country solely because they couldn't make a monetary payment prior to being convicted of anything. So um, on January 15, 2015, um, I had sort of converted all of our legal filings and pleadings uh, on the debtor's prison issue to challenge the money bail system. And I went to the local jail in, in a place called Clanton, Alabama, and I met Christy Don Barton. And um, Christy became that, that, that morning, the first person to challenge the American money bail system on equal protection and due process grounds since the rise of mass incarceration. And that morning um, when I met Christy, she, it was something I'll never forget. You know, she had been uh, arrested because she couldn't, um, you know, she was sh accused of shoplifting from Walmart and she couldn't feed her family and um, she couldn't afford a few hundred dollars to get out of jail, but she also didn't know where her children were. As happens to so many parents who are arrested and so many people that I've represented, there's a real sense of dread and panic that, 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 that seeps in when you realize like, you don't know where your children are. Um, I've had many clients, the police raid their home, um, take them away and just leave the children there, babies, toddlers. Um, and Christy was really distraught. She did, she wanted to know where her children were and how they were doing and what was going on, but she couldn't even afford enough money to pay the for-profit phone company at the jail. And so she started crying and screaming. 
and she was inconsolable. And so they did what they often do in jails that I've seen across the country. They took her out of the cell. They brought her to a little corner of the jail. Um, this exists in every state that I've, that I've uh, investigated this in. And they took her to a little part that has no security cameras and they have a chair there. And they strapped her to the chair and they started tasing her body over and over and over again. And I took photographs of these taser wounds the next morning when I met her. And in spite of all of that, um, she said to me, um, I, I want to challenge this system and I want to make sure that no mother ever has to go through this again. And, you know, um, it's a really powerful um, uh, moment. And that night, you know, we filed her case. And in the um, 10 months that followed, we filed 12 class action lawsuits against 12 different cities challenging the, the, the notion that people can be confined to a cage just because they can't make a monetary payment. And within a few months of, of her case, um, Christy had unfortunately passed away due to <clears throat> causes associated with her desperate poverty that were utterly preventable. She didn't live to see us win her case and eliminate the use of cash bail and misdemeanor cases in her town. And she didn't live to see um, the U.S. Department of Justice file a brief in our case supporting our position, which, which converted our position from this sort of wacky view of a small D.C. nonprofit like Civil Rights Corps um, into the you know, official position of US government. And in the years that have followed, we've brought these cases all over the country, um, winning landmark cases, like the case I just mentioned in Houston, which is getting about 17,000, 18,000 people out of jail every single year, just in Houston alone, to cases that we won in, in the Nevada Supreme Court, striking down the cash bail system, striking down the cash bail system in California, um, bringing these lawsuits in Chicago, um, working with partners all over the country, um, uh, to bring these cases in Massachusetts, um, in Oklahoma, um, you name it, we, we, we've been there and we're, we're working on, on these issues. Um, and I think um, the, the, the point that I, I'd like to shift to, well, I'll just pause there, Gertrude, to make sure um, before we go on, uh, are there any other questions that people have so far? Uh, let me or check. Uh, not so far. Okay, great. Um, well, please, so, um, you know, yeah. add a question or, or comment if, if you if you want yeah. to, so I don't have to just talk at you the whole time. Um, so one thing that became very, very clear as we started bringing these bail cases, and because of the death of Sandra Bland and the death of Khalif Browder and so many other things that happened um, uh, around the country, um, people started to pay attention to the money bill um, system. Um, I see there's a couple of questions. Yes, um, one is um, if we are winning these cases only for misdemeanors. The answer is no. All of the constitutional um, issues that we're raising are equally applicable in misdemeanor and felony cases. So um, while some of the initial cases we brought were with respect to misdemeanors, um, the cases that we bring now are mostly actually with respect to felonies. Um, and we're, we're winning these cases around the country um, there is a significant pushback uh, now that 40% of the federal judiciary has been appointed by um, Trump. There's a significant pushback with some of these principles. And so it'll remain to be seen you know, how, what the future of this litigation is. Uh, I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, Christie's uh, mother has now, um, and, and other family have now, to answer the other question in the chat, Christie's mother and her other family are, have um, taken care of her children after her death. Um, so um, I think that the, um, the thing that, that really emerged over the last few years as bail reform has become a big topic of conversation as we've been winning these cases over and over again, something very dangerous started happening. Um, the interests that created the criminal punishment bureaucracy and that profited off of the bail system um, uh, have, have figured out that the writing is on the wall for the cash bail system in this country. And so they are proposing sort of reforms that by and large are designed to reproduce all of the same outcomes, to keep the architecture of the system functioning exactly as it's functioning, um, uh, but to have put different labels on it. So let me tell you exactly what I mean by that. Um, so around the country, um, the, uh, the, the main sort of response to the cash bail system has been to promote um, increased pretrial detention. Um, and the main response 
uh, on the privatization of cash of the bail industry has been, yeah, if we get rid of the money bail bond industry, um, we're going to let them reorganize themselves and be the person that sells you the GPS monitor and the drug device and and the um, uh, for-profit supervision company. And so what we've seen, um, I'll just give you the example of what happened in the federal system. In the federal system, um, in 1984, after years of advocacy um, the uh, from some of the most prominent uh, people in the legal system, including, you know, Bobby Kennedy, who was sort of the, the leading voice for this kind of bail reform um, for many years, um, they passed the Federal Bail Reform Act of 1984. On the day that act was passed, it, it, it essentially prohibited jailing someone just because they can't pay. Um, so they got rid of this problem, this injustice of, of, of wealth-based detention in federal court. On the day they passed that, that, that law, about 24% of all people charged with federal crimes were detained just because they were poor. So it was a big problem. However, 37 years later, after decades of, of bail reform in the federal courts, the detention rate is now over 73%. So we've tripled actual detention. Um, and if you look at the people who are detained, it's more disproportionately poor and more disproportionately black than it was before bail reform. So um, bail reform um, took the form of dramatically increasing the ability of courts to detain people without bond, okay? And it, created a number of different ways of funneling people into pretrial detention. And we've seen the same thing in many of the states that are proposing bail reform. The other thing that's happened uh, all over the country is that the interests that the multi-billion dollar bail industry, the private prison industry, um, some of the surveillance corporations, telecom companies, they are now buying up all of the companies that do sort of supervision and, and alternatives to incarceration. So, they now have a multi-billion dollar GPS industry and drug testing industry. And so the same corporate interests are taking the same amounts of money from the same population, but instead of the label on their store being a bail bond company, the label on their store is like a GPS tracking company and drug test distributor. Um, so I think it's, it's very important when we bring these fights that we don't think of, of like a legal case or, um, or you know, just the principle of, of, of ending wealth-based detention as an end in itself. Um, the courts have Alex, really, yes. Uh, there are a few questions uh, on your just, just prior topic um, in both the, in the chat and the Q&A. Jason asked about the progress in New York City, uh, since a lot of people are locked up because they can't afford bail taking plea deals that you stated previously. And also in the chat, um, there was a question about the obligation of social yeah, services yeah. for children. Yeah, so the, the, the social services piece is, is just sort of beyond the scope of this talk. But let me just say that often when the police arrest people, they don't comply with even the most basic regulations about what to do with children who are, who are on the scene. Um, they, they often do send them to social services, which is its own problem because it can be very difficult for people to get children back um, from that system once the police have taken them there. Anyway, um, on the other uh, points, uh, New York passed a bail reform law a couple of years ago. Um, New York is actually, in some respects, the national leader. Um, things are unspeakably bad in much of New York right now, but it is probably the best set of state laws that there is around the country which is really unfortunate. <laughs> um, there are so many people in New York cages right now just because they can't pay cash bail. And yet the rates of pretrial jailing in New York are way lower than they are uh, uh, throughout the country. Um, probably the worst state is California, um, followed by Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Um, but virtually every state is, is um, uh, well, every state is way worse than um, every other country in the world um, in terms of the rates of pretrial human caging and, and the racial disparities involved. New York's bill um, was good for a few reasons. It um, created what we call a detention net um, and a net for electronic monitoring as well, which, which is really a form of, of e-carceration where you're incarcerated and surveilled and tracked in your own home. And this is what Michelle Alexander has recently written about in the New York Times. You know, e-carceration is sort of the new digital Jim Crow. 
and it's a way that court systems are are going to convert from um, brick and mortar prisons into trapping people in their homes and in very small segments of, of communities um, as a way of controlling and surveilling black and brown communities. Um, but New York did something good that, that other states have not yet done. Um, Illinois just did something um, uh, not quite as good as New York, but, but, but very encouraging, where they, they, they say, we are going to um, prevent judges from even having the option of caging someone pre-trial, putting a GPS monitor on them in cases that don't involve, um, you know, violent uh, conduct or, or really serious uh, felony conduct. And so um, by limiting the discretion and power of this bureaucracy to do business as usual, um, the New York bill is really a landmark achievement. And it's, it's, it's no wonder that the prosecutors and police unions and bail industry have come out so um, vociferously and fraudulently in New York, just making up statistics, um, you know, doing all kinds of, of, of false uh, sort of email blasts and um, planting all kinds of, of really race baiting Willie Horton style stories and like the New York Post. And like the reason they're doing that is that the New York bail law actually does threaten the, the sort of functioning and profit making of the giant punishment bureaucracy in New York State. And so it's a real credit to the defense bar, the advocacy community in New York, um, to, to many of the legislature, legislators who listened to them and actually passed you know, a pretty groundbreaking bail bill that, that doesn't nearly come close to addressing the harm that, that the bail system causes, but that is the best model that we have um, that any state has done. Hope that answers your question. Um, Richard? There's another question in the chat that's related to, uh, do individuals have to pay for the GPS trackers themselves? And I would add something else, is, is all this privatization um, of toilet paper and soap and everything, do the incarcerated persons, the caged people have to pay for all of these themselves? Um, oh, yes. that's cool. That, these that's are really great questions. So, um, uh, by and large, around the country, um, people have to pay for GPS devices themselves. They typically cost about $12 a day. And in many places around the country, people are just illegally kept in jail, even though they've been released on a GPS monitor, just because they can't pay the fees um, for the GPS monitor. Not only are they charged for the GPS monitoring device, they're charged for uh, risk assessment algorithms to be, to be administered to them. They're charged $18 to $20 per pop for every drug test they're given, they're charged a monthly supervision fee for their probation officers. The entire system is a, is a giant cash cow for various interests. And on top, so, you know, I was just talking with some advocates from Texas today on, 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 on email and, you know, when even minor misdemeanors in Texas will cost you between $1,500 and $2,000 in fees. Um, and, and everyone has their hand in the pocket. Um, someone else is, you know, trying to, to grab a small portion of these fees. But when I um, brought a, a, a landmark lawsuit in, in, in Louisiana challenging the system of debtors' prisons and cash bail, it turned out that um, the judges, the prosecutors, the public defenders, the sheriffs, and the bail bond companies all took a percentage cut of every bail bond that was set. It also turned out that the judges, the prosecutors, the sheriff, and the public defenders, and many other entities all took a cut every time courts it, um, issued court costs and fees. And so if you're someone who's arrested in New Orleans, um, the jailer who brings you into the courtroom, the prosecutor arguing against you, the judge decided the case, and even your own advocate, the public defender, are all taking a percentage fee of anything that you're charged. And that is the system that we have in this country. Um, I will say that one really good thing about um, New York's reforms recently is that um, it bars charging people fees for these things pre-trial. So um, you won't be charged fees in New York for like the GPS monitor or, or other things like that. Although, um, you know, obviously the GPS monitor is another form of, of e-carceration, like I mentioned. And so, um, we, you know, we shouldn't be at, you know, advocating their use at all. Um, but at least in New York, um, individual indigent criminal defendants aren't saddled with enormous debt and threatened to be put in jail if they can't pay. Um, there's another question here um, from Justin. Why would they have to pay money for their own state issued probation officers? That's a really great question. That is the standard practice in almost all of the country is you pay fees for probation and parole. It's another way of 
um, controlling and, and surveilling and 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 funding these systems. You know, one of the things about these bureaucracies is that once they're created, um, they're very hard to dismantle. Um, and so they, they operate on sort of their own laws of nature. They're constantly trying to expand and increase and metastasize and get bigger. And one of the ways they do that is they show the state that they're generating their own revenue. And so it's become completely commonplace all over the country. People would have to pay monthly fees for their probation officer. We have done a lot of litigation around the country challenging the system of privatized probation. So in many states, they actually tried to privatize the probation function and, and have people pay a private company to supervise them. And you know, the, the most, one of the most unjust things I've ever witnessed is that these private companies, so uh, the way it works is like you get a ticket or a misdemeanor or a felony and you owe, let's say $200 for your ticket. If you can't afford to pay that, you're put on private probation. Then the private company charges you an extra $40 a month. But if you can only, let's say you're working a minimum wage job, you can only pay 15 or 20 bucks a month for this. That money is taken by the company first for its own fees. So your, your debts just only increase. So you can be on probation for a year. You could have paid several hundred dollars on the 200 you initially owed. You could have been jailed five or six times because you missed a payment. And you could still owe four or five times what you originally owed because the fees are adding up from the company too. And they're, they're not subtracting from your principal debt. They're only paying their own fees. This was a, a case that we filed a number of cases actually under RICO and various constitutional provisions around the country challenging this system of privatized probation. But what a lot of places are doing is they're cutting out the private middle company and they're just charging people themselves for their own state run and county run probation and parole. It's, it's, it's really an incredible injustice and, and um, one that, that I encourage you all to look into it. And, and Gertrude, um, there's an organization called Worth Rises, which is based in New York City, which um, is uh, the definitive sort of home for tracking all of the corporations that are profiting off of the prison complex, whether it's toilet paper or um, uh, medical care or phone companies. Um, and so Worth Rises actually has an online curriculum that you can go look at um, to learn about um, all of the various ways that the prison profiteering industry is functioning. It's a really fantastic organization. Okay. Um, they were, yeah, they were would, instrumental. I was one more be, things. Great. I just want to put that into the, or maybe you can write it into the chat where the site is or the yeah. name. Um, it's called Worth Rises. I just put it into the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you oh, put it in the I, chat, everybody can access it. Um, so the, the, that organization was instrumental with a number of other organizers on the ground in New York City to, to get um, the fees for jail calls in New York City eliminated. And uh, today they're, they're actually working on a campaign. I just, I just tweeted about it on my Twitter, um, which I'll put in the, the chat, um, my Twitter handle, um, to, because Connecticut is considering a bill um, that would um, make uh, all jail and prison phone calls free for families. Um, Okay, I just, oops, I just typed it in wrong, sorry. <laughs> and you can follow me on Twitter if you're interested in, in learning more about that stuff. Um, Greg asked another question, which was, what do you think about the negative effects of the rollbacks um, of the hard-fought bail reforms in New York State? Um, so for those of you who, who weren't following, after the, the um, pretty good um, bail reform um, passed, you know, by no means sufficient and by no means what people like me were advocating for, but I say pretty good meaning relative to what other states are doing. Um, the uh, prosecution lobby and the bail bond lobby and the police union sort of went on an all out war. And they, they and their allies in the media um, started taking anecdotal cases that usually had absolutely nothing to do with bail reform, um, if you actually even looked at them, but you know, there's a lot of irresponsible journalism. Um, and they started pounding this drum that they needed to, to roll back the bail reform law. They succeeded in getting um, a few, what I think of as actually fairly minor rollbacks. It, it doesn't, it, it doesn't um, um, uh, roll back the, the, the sort of core pieces of the, of the bill, and it still leaves New York with probably the best bail law in the country. Um, which again is not saying much, um, but I think uh, it, it's, it's a very important lesson um, 
for, you know, um, how to build these movements and make them keep going. Um, because what should have happened after the New York bill passed is we should have realized it was nowhere near sufficient to dismantle um, this incredible bureaucracy that is sort of um, extracting wealth from poor families and caging people. And there's no evidence that it makes society any safer at all. These massive investments should be reinvested into, into things that, that communities actually need. Um, Pre-trial incarceration is one of the most harmful, um, wasteful, irrational forms of investment. Um, instead of like pushing on further, um, we weren't prepared for the backlash and we actually got rolled back a little bit because um, you know, it, we, we hadn't prepared for that fight. And so I think it's a, it's a political lesson that like once you win some of these reforms, it's, it's very important that you keep pushing and you keep seizing the narrative and telling the truth about what's going on because there's gonna be some really entrenched interests. If you ever get anything passed that, that really threatens the system, um, it's going to be uh, really, really important to, to prevent them from rolling it back right away. Um, I'm going to pause again there because there's a couple of more questions. Um, yeah, there are a couple of chat questions. Okay. Um, cases um, challenging elimination of personal bills, and a thank you for for the work you do. Uh, but the, the um, question yes. about visits. This is uh, this this visits question is something near and dear to my heart, so I'm really glad you asked about it, Steve. Um, this was something I was actually planning on working on, um, and then the pandemic hit, and of course, in-person visits were eliminated for other reasons. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, uh, I, I did a bunch of research on this, and it turns out that yes, um, in the early '80s, late '70s and early '80s. Um, uh, some facilities started eliminating um, visits uh, to their jails. Um, it was really the, sort of the dawn of the tough on crime era. And um, there were some facilities that, that passed sort of really uh, misguided um, efforts to, to cut people off from their families and, and communities. And the cases made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And um, the, in, a, in really heated, um, contentious Supreme Court decisions, um, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court in the 80s held that um, if you're accused of a crime, you have absolutely no fundamental right at all to see your children or your spouse or your family. Um, just the mere accusation of a crime and your confinement in a jail um, removes your right. And so the federal courts have really um, eliminated the the ability to challenge. I think there are some holes in that because um, of the way those cases were written. But I think what we would really need to do to challenge this, this unspeakable harm of child and family separation in local facilities is actually go to state courts and um, challenge it that basically on their own terms that like these are actually not based on security, which is what the Supreme Court upheld those, those um, efforts in the early 80s. But actually, it's based on profit, number one. So I think that's a line of attack. And then also, number two, um, I think state, court, state courts can, can interpret their own constitutions in a different way to say, actually, you know what, there is a right, there's a fundamental right to um, have contact with your children. And many state court constitutions have been interpreted to protect a fundamental right to sort of family association. And, and, and in, in, it, in its, I think, a, uh, a strong part of the liberty that state constitutions um, protect. So I think we, we will have almost no success in the federal courts, given um, uh, the turn that the federal courts have taken over the last 40 years um, and some of the prior precedent. But I do think that this can and should be something that we bring to state courts as soon as the pandemic is over. Um, I'm gonna go to Albert's question. Um, if the fees are being imposed are beyond the means of the poor, does that not mean that most fees charged to the poor are being paid by the general public? Does it create and does it create an incentive for the government to curtail these programs? Um, this is a really complicated question, Albert, and it, the economics of it um, play out differently in different places. One fundamental problem is that um, the, the, the individuals and entities who are um, charging the fees are not the same governmental unit that often bears the cost of those fees. So for example, there might be fees that the DA or the local judges um, or the sheriff charge and that they get the money for, 
but the cost of incarceration is borne by the city or by the state. Um, and so the incentives are really misaligned, um, even though everyone understands that these systems of charging people fees are actually overall um, costing the taxpayers an enormous amount of money. It's just um, it, the, the wrong government actors have the wrong incentives, if that makes sense. Um, it's, it's almost like when local DAs get tough on crime, um, it's the state taxpayers end up putting the bill for larger prison populations, but the local DAs have no financial incentive to stop, you know, um, the sort of Billy Horton style tough on crime uh, race based um, rhetoric that they that they use. And so this is a actually like a big problem of misaligned incentives, Albert. Thank you for asking that. Uh, any more? Uh, there is a question. Oh, oh can yeah. you hear me? There's a question in chat about what can ordinary people do? And I think that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's three or four things that ordinary people can do. Um, number one, um, you have to educate yourself about these issues. There's so much um, noise out there on the internet, um, in our professional lives. Um, there's so much propaganda about how the system works um, that is designed to make people either indifferent to or supportive of what the system is, is doing. People don't know what's happening in the criminal system. And if people knew more about it, it would be shocking. And so I think it's really, really important. And that's why I wrote the book, Usual Cruelty. Thank you so much, Gertrude, for mentioning it at the top. Um, by the way, the, the book, um, Usual Cruelty, is um, uh, uh, supporting an amazing nonprofit called the SE Justice Group. So all of the royalties from the book um, go to this nonprofit, none of them go to me. Um, and this is a nonprofit that organizes women with incarcerated loved ones. Um, but the book was really designed to give people an introduction into how this system functions, into why it functions the way that it does. Um, there is a lot of really great resources online um, to read. Um, I really like uh, an organization called um, transformharm.org. Um, um, and um, I think that there's, there's podcasts, there's um, news sources, there's um, really good journalism now. Um, uh, the Appeal is a good organization that does sort of daily journalism on these issues that is, that is quite effective. Um, just, you know, the first piece is like, just educate you yourself and the people around you. Um, there's some really great books that you can read in groups with other people. I, I think the book, you know, the books to start with as well are Are Prisons Obsolete um, by Angela Davis. Um, it's a really great introduction to this. Of course, if you haven't read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. So the first step is just like start learning about um, what's going on and um, it exposes yourself to more critical pieces of news and perspective. Follow people on Twitter who are more critical of how these systems function, provide a different set of information from the information that you usually get. Um, the second thing I think you can do is figure out like, what is a good way for me to get involved in my local community? These issues are so hyper-local. They're happening, these injustices are happening in all of our communities all over the country. What's a good way of getting involved? Um, I think some really good options are if you have a local court watch program, for example, there's a court watch in New York City. Um, when my mother retired recently, she joined uh, the court watch program in Pittsburgh and has been doing that for many hours a week, um, holding these judges accountable, watching what they're doing, taking notes, reporting out to the public on what prosecutors and judges are doing. Um, these are like efforts um, of the community to come together, to build solidarity, to build relationships, to bring transparency to the system, to learn about what's actually happening. Um, there's another um, uh, really beautiful, promising sort of set of activities all over the country and particularly active in, in Brooklyn and, and Queens um, is, the, is local mutual aid programs. Um, find a local mutual aid program and get involved with people in your community. Um, you'll, you'll meet so many amazing people um, in that process and you'll start like getting direct experience with and access to um, how the legal system is being experienced by the most vulnerable people in our society. And it, it's very important to um, distinguish like mutual aid from charity. Um, it's not about um, just charitable giving to people. It's about 
coming together with other people in solidarity and co collectively as a community providing aid to people who need it um, as a way, as a sort of a way of organizing people together as a political tool to, to identify how these systems are wrong and, and what we can do to change them. Um, so those are some, some local things that I would encourage you to get involved with. There's also, depending on where you live, local community bail funds. Um, this is something that's less and less um, happening in New York State now because of the new reforms, but elsewhere around the country, there's local community bail funds that are a really great organizing tool. So I hope that was um, helpful. There's another question from Trish. Um, does the US have an unusual desire to punish and different ideals of justice in other less incarcerated countries? The answer to that question is yes. Um, the US has um, a very unique and weird and different um, sense that when something bad happens, the reason for that bad thing isn't some sort of systemic problem. It's someone's fault. It's a bad person who did that bad thing. When someone is addicted to a drug, they are bad. They are worthless. They need to, to, um, to figure out how to fix themselves in this problem, right? When someone harms someone through violence, it's not because we have um, poverty and desperation and lead poisoning, which actually, by the way, is associated with um, huge increases in, in risk of, of violent behavior later in life. You've been poisoned with lead as a child. It's not, it's not the result of systems that um, promote toxic masculinity, et cetera. It's, it's the result of a bad person. That is a, a unique view. Other countries have a much different understanding. Um, and by the way, I'll note that this same mentality that like bad things happen because of bad people and good things happen because of good people is the common refrain that we're taught in terms of the reform um, movement, right? So like we see police violence and police um, choke someone to death. Um, and the, the response is often, well, um, we just need more good cops or that was a bad cop. Right, and I think that is profoundly uh, wrong. It's wrong-headed. Right, it's it's not the problem with police is not that there's a few bad cops and a few good cops. Um, the problem is systemic and structural. Um, I wrote a, a piece about this uh, recently, which I'll put into the chat um, um, about you know the problems with the, with with the way we think about good cops and bad cops. Um, but I think this idea you asked about Trish is like actually very very important. Um, we need to stop, we, there is not a single shred of empirical evidence. For, the, for people like me who care very deeply about violence in our society, about all forms of violence, the forms of violence that police care about and the forms of violence that police don't care about, like eviction from people's homes with fraudulent the, you know, foreclosures and poisoning of lead and water and air, um, uh, violence of, of wage theft, which kills more people every single year than all violent crime combined. Um, so, but for those who care about, about violence, care about violence against women, about domestic violence, um, about sexual assault, there's not a shred of evidence that the way to a society where those things happen less is to brutally cage and traumatize the very people who committed those crimes and then send them right back out into society after traumatizing them in a cage. There's just no evidence that it works. So, um, not only is it a very limited conception of public safety, in other countries, they have a much more expansive notion of public safety. It has to do with, with are people getting health care they need? Are people getting the mental health care that, they, that they, they need? Are their environmental conditions adequate? Are they getting the safe places to live and, and to be nurtured? And, and, and the, the problem with our current system is that it keeps exposing people through this frame of punishment and the desire to punish it exposes people to cycles of trauma and people who are traumatized are more likely to then traumatize themselves or other people again in the future. And that's this very unique cycle that you, that you gestured at Trish in your question that doesn't exist in the same way in other countries. Although Hollywood and American you know, media culture um, and a lot of large corporations who profit off of that mentality are desperately trying to export it send it to Canada and Mexico and England and mainland Europe. Um, and there's a, sort of a very troubling global cabal of um, security and prison um, corporations who 
who have succeeded in privatizing much of the detention infrastructure in Australia, for example. Um, and all these multinational corporations are, are trying to export this punishment frame um, because it's, it's, it's so very profitable. And so that's something that we have to be very, very careful about. Um, Gertrude, I think I hit all the questions in the... Um, yes, I, I, I think so. Um, yeah. And I appreciate your, your link to, to other things as well. So, yeah, so, yeah I think ahead. all the questions have been addressed. Okay. Um, so I think like, and, and you know, I, I, um, I don't want to keep people too long. I'll just say a few more things. And then if there, if there aren't any additional questions, um, then we can wrap up a little bit, a little bit early, if that's okay with you, Gertrude. Okay. Um, yeah. the, what I wanted to say is um, a little bit more about the bail system. Um, so I, I gestured a little bit earlier about the constitutional arguments we're making, but I think it's worth just stating very clearly that um, the constitutional arguments we're making are that no human being can be kept in a cage because she can't make a payment. If the government wants to detain a human being in a cage away from her family prior to criminal conviction, it has to prove that it's absolutely necessary, that there's no other alternative conditions that could address some particular interest that the government has in this, detaining this person. They have to have a rigorous hearing with a lawyer and evidence. They have to meet a clear and convincing evidence standard. The person has to be given an opportunity to confront evidence against them. This is a really rigorous um, process. And it's happening even in New York State, that process is barely happening at all. Um, it's, it's more and more happening in some of the larger urban jurisdictions, but but in many of the rural places around New York State, this kind of process doesn't happen at all. And it actually you know, often doesn't even happen in, in, in even the largest um, urban jurisdictions um, with the most um, successful and well-resourced public defender offices. And that I think is because um, all over the country, we have become so desensitized to human caging that we stopped treating the bail decision as such an important moment of the, of the criminal process. Um, when I was a public defender, two of the most well-resourced public defenders in the country, the Federal Defender's Office and the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, um, in my entire time there, I don't think any lawyer in our office filed a single bail appeal. It just wasn't part of our practice. Um, I look back on it now with, with a great deal of, of, of guilt and regret. Um, and I, and I, I say this with a, a great deal of, of humility because um, you're so overwhelmed in that job. There's so many injustices at every turn, and your clients are in such desperate situations, um, it, it's hard to know what to focus on. And yet, um, we somehow allowed a situation to occur where we weren't desperately fighting every single day for our clients to be home with their families prior to trial. And, and we now know, um, based on all of the empirical research, that being detained prior to trial dramatically increases your chances of committing new crime in the future of you losing your job, losing your housing, being separate, being, losing custody of your children, um, not just being separated from them, but, but actually having custody terminated. Um, it dramatically increases your chances of pleading guilty and dramatically increases the, the median sentence that you're likely exposed to. And all of that flows, controlling for all other variables, flows from whether you're detained or not. And um, I think it's absolutely vital that we as advocates um, think of new ways of resensitizing everyone who works in the system to the incredible pain, suffering, and brutality, and trauma that this assembly line legal system is, is inflicting. And so one of the things that, that we used to do in, is not only, um, uh, one of the things that we still do at the Civil Rights Corps um, is, is think about this in terms of both in-court and out-of-court advocacy. In court, we need to be really different um, we need to stop accepting the standard way things are being done. Not only do we need to, to, um, to make the right legal arguments, but we have to tell our clients stories in court in a way that changes the way people think about them. And this requires really a, a commitment to investigation and fact gathering so that when you come to a court for a bail hearing, you can tell your client's story. You can put the mother and the father and the football coach and the employer on the stand and actually talk about what this person means and what, what kind of environment they can come home to and um, what the consequences are for them and their family 
um, for their children of caging them pretrial. And this is something that we just barely are doing. Um, and so we're working all over the country with some really amazing participatory defense hubs and local organizers and directly impacted people who've been through the pretrial bail system themselves to help train public defenders offices on what would it look like to have a more holistic understanding of, of, of narrative and storytelling at this stage. Another thing that, that we do is very basic things in court, like asking the court for each hearing to unshackle our clients so that they can hug their children or their spouse. Um, and all of a sudden now we're not thinking about a dangerous person who we have to control and cage, we're thinking about a loved one um, who has, um, you know, when I used to do sentencing hearings, um, used to have my clients um, share the artwork that they made in the jail with the court and explain to the court the artistic decisions that they were making. Um, so the in-court advocacy has to rigorously and, and in great detail put time and effort and energy into preparing and building relationships with people and their families so that you can tell these stories in court. The out-of-court advocacy has to do the same thing. Um, lawyers, public defenders, and others have to build relationships with people in their communities who are directly impacted by incarceration so that um, we are part of a broader movement that is changing the general public narrative around how much harm these systems are causing and the fact that they're not bringing any benefits to society. They're not making these communities any safer. Um, and so it's been really exciting to watch the way that public defenders in New York City in particular have joined together with uh, many people in local organizing movements, people who used to be their clients and their clients' families. Um, we're organizing uh, around um, divesting from punishment and surveillance and, and policing and pain and caging, and investing in the things that actually are gonna make these communities safer like theater and music and poetry programs for children and athletics and mental health treatment and safe places to live. And I think that kind of out of court advocacy uh, is really, really important. Um, how do we collect and tell these stories? How do we work with organizers to lift them up and to change the narrative that is currently being dominated by the old school punishment bureaucrats, New York Post type um, police union, um, which has a very different and very destructive and very dangerous view of human nature in my um, I'll stop there because I think there's one more question. Yes. Yes. Um, there is another question. Oh. What is this? Um, Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. There. Did you read the question from Brian? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, Brian, this is a very difficult question about yeah. you know the question is essentially whether I'm worried about the current movement of criminal justice reform being derailed. Um, I'm very worried about it for the reasons that you suggest, both because um, the federal judiciary is now dominated by Trump appointed judges who have a very different understanding of even the most basic sets of values and norms. Um, so unless um, the, the courts, I mean, one thing that's desperately needed is to increase the spots on the district courts and circuit courts, um, because those courts are now dominated by a very hard right wing. The federal district and appellate courts are way to the right of the US Supreme Court, which is itself um, the furthest to the right it's been in generations. Um, but the, the lower courts are actually way more to the right than the US Supreme Court. And this is a, this is a big threat, but I will say, um, it would be a mistake to think about courts as ever really being an engine of social change. The American judiciary has since its inception, just gone along essentially in every era with what powerful forces in the, in the society have wanted, whether it was theft of indigenous land, massacre of indigenous people, slavery, um, Jim Crow in the era of racial terror, the rise of mass incarceration, um, the, the blocking the ability of women to vote. Um, these are all things that the, you know, whether it's, I think courts really respond to power building and social movement. It's why that the Supreme Court rejected the same-sex marriage cases several decades before it then accepted them. It wasn't because the 14th Amendment changed. It was relying on the same few words, the same amendment. It wasn't because the lawyers got better and fancier, right? It wasn't because the judges were smarter. It was because there was a social movement in that intervening period that changed the way we all think about same-sex marriage. What we need to focus on, Brian, I think, is building a genuine social movement that changes the way we think about, about, about racial racial injustice, it changes the way we think about um, how these systems actually reinforce white supremacy, changes the way we think about poverty, changes the way we think about 
um, sort of collective um, togetherness and changes the way we think about human caging. And so that's the project that we're engaged in. How do we, um, working through local associations of lawyers, um, how do we, working with, with incarcerated people, with formerly incarcerated people, with organizers, with media, with artists um, and poets and musicians, um, we have an artist in residence and a poet in residence and a musician in residence at Civil Rights Corps, all of them are formerly incarcerated. And how do we work with, with people to develop a much, uh, yeah, I use the word radical, a much more radical understanding of this change systems need. But what I'm really describing is a very common sense idea, which shouldn't be radical at all, which is that if the system is racist and is costing uh, hundreds of billions of dollars a year with no discernible benefit, then we should try something else. And that really shouldn't be uh, that radical of a view. So um, with that, um, I, uh, I'll probably leave it there um, and just encourage you all. I also say one more thing, actually. Um, I mentioned the book, Usual Cruelty. Um, my publisher in New York um, has been really generous enough to offer free copies of the book to anyone who teaches a class, high school, college, or law school. And so all your students can get free copies of the book. And if you, um, if you do that, um, every student that gets a for every student that gets a copy of the book, um, a free copy will be sent to someone in prison. And so we're really trying to get these ideas out there. And I hope you'll take a look at the book and get the book and, and let us know after you read it if, if it's something that you think that your students and, and others would be interested in. So um, thank you so much, Gertrude, for setting this up and to the, to the, to the bar for having me and, and I hope it was, it was useful. Yeah, thank you so much, Alec. I think by the comments and the questions, this, this subject, I, for instance, did not know the expanse of the privatization of so many things in, in the criminal system. Um, I, I no longer can even use the word justice in combination with criminal, it just doesn't even, make sense anymore. Um, I think that the approach to a holistic approach, not only to society, but in specifics to the approach, even in to practicing law, to get to know, as you say, get to know your client, get to know the situation. Um, law, I, I'm, an, I'm retired for, from law right now, but um, in, Retired from practicing in a firm, let's say. Uh, but I feel very strongly that things have to be changed and that considering the whole uh, as lawyers and as society is the only way that we can adjust our society and right some of the wrongs that have been perpetuated since the 1600s. Um, and it's something that the country as a whole has to recognize. And I think that is our big job. As you say, education, education is key. And this runs through all the different seminars, uh, presentations um, that have been on, on different topics that I've attended, but in particular through the senior lawyers, because we as a group have witnessed so much that we can give back now um, and hopefully in a positive way that to, to help society heal and to, um, and I appreciate your opening our eyes to so many things in the criminal injustice system. Uh, and I really appreciate your time. If there are any more questions and I see a couple of things in the chat, in the Q and A, just let me make sure. Um, yeah, there are a couple of things you might want to ask. Mary McCory and Albert have a couple of questions about how the United States system and fits in the world. Do you see the questions? Or? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I, I'm not an expert on what other countries do. So I, right. I, I couldn't tell you, Mary, um, you know, which particular country um, do I look to as the best example. I will say that virtually every other country that you can think of um, has a dramatically smaller criminal punishment bureaucracy. So Canada, Mexico, Europe, Japan, um, 
uh, you know, have systems that are five to 10 times smaller than ours, including many countries in, in Asia and Africa, um, Latin America. Um, the only countries that even come somewhere close to this country's, you know, sort of system of surveillance and control and communication are Russia and China. Um, and um, so I, so I think virtually, if you picked virtually any other country, you'd probably find a model that, that is, um, that we have a lot to learn from. But I will say that like, we, it's, this is not a complicated vexing question. We, we ourselves had a system that was five to 10 times smaller as recently as 45 years ago. And we made very particular policy decisions um, over that, that time period, um, most of which by the Democratic Party, including Clinton's and Biden's bill to add 100,000 police officers in the mid 90s, which exploded the rates of incarceration and, and set off um, an incredible um, industry of private um, um, profit. Um, and the one thing I didn't really mention is there's a, and this gets to the other question that um, Albert raised, is that one of the main ways in which these systems are, are filtering is because the, the military budget of the US is, is so astronomical and increasing so much, um, a lot of the, the, a lot of this, almost all of the technology we now see in local police departments actually originated in um, military defense contractors. And they opened up a whole new business model um, of pioneering stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan and in, in the so-called war on terror, and then filtering it back into domestic law enforcement. There are just dozens and dozens and dozens of these startups and companies. Uh, and so if you look at the last 40 years, actually there's a, a through line. Um, and this is the same thing they're now trying in lots of other countries. Um, these companies, these Big military industrial complex contractors have a lot of relations with foreign governments and foreign police. U.S. government has a training program for um, for the last 40 years for foreign police officers and military officers. And this is in these programs, they introduce all these people to these companies and they introduce these people to these, these ways of thinking, um, to the weaponry that they'll need, to the surveillance technology that they're going to use. And then they send them back out to their home country. And then they start advocating in their home country and their police departments and their military to bring these companies in to pay for this technology. Um, and this is how it sort of gets disseminated. And um, it's actually a really frightening concept. Um, city of San Francisco just, and so this is becoming global now. The city of San Francisco just signed a multi-million dollar contract with an Israeli defense contractor to do GPS surveillance of poor black and brown people in San Francisco who are accused of crime. Um, this is truly a global um, industry now, and it's really linked to the increase of military budgets as well. Um, so I, you know, that's just one thought um, about how it's uh, how it's um, disseminating. But I think it's an important thought. To, to, and um, there's a, a man named Stuart Schrader. Stuart Schrader has written a lot about this, and I, I recommend his work uh, very highly. Okay. Okay, Alex, I I'm so appreciate your your coming speaking today, and I'd say coming, but we're all virtual, so it's a virtual coming. And um, on behalf of the the city bar and all the members of the the committees who co-sponsored you, um, thank you so much, and very good luck. And hopefully there'll be some volunteers for the various aspects. You gave several possible ways that ordinary people can can help in this situation and we look forward to a change um a global change hopefully thank you so much thank you so much bye-bye bye-bye